Martin O'Neill, welcome to the football show. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted to get the chance to chat to you. And first of all, I've got to say, congratulations. You guys have made it to the European Championships. And as you know, you can see the sincerity <laughs> oozing out of me. <laughs> yeah, commiserations to you then as well. Too. I always said that we would do it, despite what you, you told me in, uh, in um, was it November of last year? Yeah, anyway, we made it. Uh, tough in Scotland, obviously, um, and I'm not saying that with a great deal of sincerity <laughs> either. But, um, well, it, it probably boiled down to one of the two of us, um, because Germany were always going to be the strong team in the group, and that even though that they might have a hiccup or two along the way, that they would eventually come through as world champions do. And I thought that Poland were quite strong. I also thought that um, I was naturally concerned about Scotland. Um, um, Good renaissance under Gordon and Georgia uh, were still a worry because the talented players as they have, as you would know from, or I would know from my days at Celtic when they had a host of them playing for Dundee. And um, so they could play a wee bit. They were the sort of the dark horses of the group and they never really got off to a great start and always had a lot of ground to cover. Anyway, despite the hiccups we had ourselves, including that defeat in um, at, uh, at Celtic Park way back last November and uh, the draw in, the game in Dublin, we finally won through. Yeah. Uh, did you, were you worried at the point of the, uh, the game uh, at Celtic Park uh, or you know, from subsequent press conferences, you seemed adamant. Did you have to convince your players, look, we're still in this, this is, you're not out of it? No, I, I think there was a lot said at that particular time. No, the answer is... Number one, that's, that's an interesting point you make about Celtic Park. I, I really did not want the game played at Celtic Park because I knew it was going to be atmospheric. And this idea, because I had managed at Celtic, that suddenly that some Scottish fan was actually going to change allegiance, it was just nonsense. And, um, uh, and I believe, and, and I, I think that, uh, that Hamden, played at Hamden, would be less atmospheric than, than, that, that, than that evening. So... Uh, and uh, I, I, so I'd never, I'd never really wanted the game to be played at Celtic Park for all the reasons I've just mentioned. So there was a great atmosphere that night, obviously, by the, uh, uh, the mainstay being the, the Scottish fans. They gave Aidan McGeady a little bit of stick as well, too. And, um, and so things worked, uh, worked for Scotland. They got the late goal, or 76, 77 minutes. We hit the post in the last moment or hit the crossbar, but... I didn't think any of the two teams created a great deal in the game, but it was never, I never felt after four matches in the competition that this was a moment to absolutely panic. And yet I was in your company and you mentioned you had a sneaky feeling that Georgia was going to be a problem. I, I well, it, that sneaky feeling wasn't just, that, that's over years and years of experience. Yeah. That just didn't just crop up, or that didn't something that gave me comfort or anything like that. I know how difficult winning football matches and uh, winning football matches are. I know how difficult away games are, and it doesn't matter whether you're playing at club level or international level. We had, we won in Georgia. Aid McGeady scored a fantastic winning goal for us when it looked as if the game was heading for a draw, and those two extra points became as important to us as let's say the win against Germany or let's say the draw in Germany. All the points mount up at the end of the day. What I thought in June was that there's no doubt by, the, by that evening when the draw had taken place, that the, uh, the game had ended in a draw in the Aviva Stadium, we were in the back foot, but never out of it. I never felt we were out of it. We were two points behind Scotland. They had the better head-to-head, -head, so effectively probably three points that we had to make up. I never felt that that was insurmountable because... In effect, we were still playing. We were still had tough games to play. Each 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 nation had, and um, and I thought that we could still do it. It probably meant that we would have to take nine or ten points in the last four games. As it turns out, we took nine, but I never felt we were out of it. And that just wasn't bravado. That that was just you know I felt that the games were still tough. And you mentioned there you were drawing on all your experience. Did you have to draw on all your experience to convince your own players? Look. This is going to map out this way. You need to believe. Yeah, I think I think there was an element of that. Yes, I think that the I don't think the players ever really lost belief in the game. I think we were disappointed, uh, disappointed to lose the late goal. Uh, obviously, in November time to lose the match, and 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 certainly disappointed at the outcome of the game, 
where we, I thought we had by miles the, be the better of the first half against Scotland uh, at the, in the Aviva Stadium. We maybe could have gone 2-0 in front. I don't think that Scotland could have complained. Then Scotland got um, the early second half goal, rocked us completely. And I felt then the next 10 or 15 minutes belonged to Scotland as they started to gain a bit of momentum, as you would expect, uh, having just scored a goal. And then I thought it levelled itself out towards the end. So we were disappointed in the sense that we didn't create enough in the second half. One great chance that uh, Marshalls made a great save from, from, uh, from Murphy. Outside that there, I can't remember anything happening at either end. And, and so, yes, we left the more disappointed team because I would have felt if we had had the head-to-head -head advantage and a couple of points clear, I'd have been feeling a lot better about it, but it was never over. I think the Germany result, in a way, may well have galvanised you guys, but it seemed to knock the stuffing out of us as well. Well, um, yeah, by that, uh, by that time it was, get, it was obviously getting very, very, very tight. You, uh, you had been beaten by Germany. I say you, I, uh, hopefully you will uh, 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 allow me to say that. Um, had been beaten by Germany uh, in the game before that. And we had won a very, very tight game against Georgia. And uh, so you were going into the match uh, against Poland. I still felt that you could get a result. And I know by that stage that we still had to match Scotland's result. Our match was still quite difficult because it was within your grasp probably that you could beat Poland or even get a draw against them. And there's a fairly decent chance that, that most critics would have thought that, well, Germany will probably beat us anyway. So you possibly, even with two games to go, might even have been going in as still slight favourites to go into a, either um, a winning second position or a certain, at least a playoff. But the, the win against Germany, as you say, it, 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 it scuppered you. We are now in a, a, a state where you know only too well when we suffer again of not making major championships, mm -hmm. we start to look at our whole game, question the foundations, question everything. Do you, are you surprised by that or do you think Scotland needs to take a look at itself? Because without being disparaging to your players, you have a, a, a team of real hard workers who play almost the way you know you demand players that they may not be world-class stars but they're a team well i don't think it's my position really to to uh, to um really evaluate uh, Scot scotland's uh, position real i think that gordon can do that quite eloquently himself um, and sometimes there's there are knee-jerk reactions to things I mean, for instance, if you talk about how tight the groups are and how, you know, the, the dividing line between success or failure is so, so tight as we've often known uh, throughout our, our sporting careers. The point is that at one stage in the game, when Scotland had gone 2-1 in front against Poland and, um, and that we were still nil-nil against Germany, uh, albeit for a period of maybe seven or eight minutes, something that I wasn't aware of at the time, I must admit, that actually you were effectively through and that we might have been the ones asking questions about ourselves. So it's, it, 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 it is that tight. Our results against Germany were, I have to say this, fantastic. You know, we, you know, we've beaten the world champions on our own ground and a great, great evening for us. And we drew with them in Gelsenkirchen as well too, at, um, uh, away from home. And that's fantastic results for us. So it would have been really disappointing for us not to have come through having had those results. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's what happens over the 10 matches. We got through. I, don't, I, think that, I, think that, um, I think that Scotland play a fine game. I think that uh, we all, ourselves included, would like, uh, you know, um, would, I, I think that we'd all like to, uh, to be able to find someone who can, who can find the, the net more often than, than we do. And we've got a, a, an older Robbie Keane. If Robbie Keane was 27 years of age, I'd be absolutely delighted. But life is passing on, and, um, and while he's been a fantastic captain for us, we're looking for another Robbie Keane to come up and score goals on a regular basis. Scotland might feel the same, that, that um, a nice build-up play, maybe need a few goals, although I think Fletcher's a very fine player. But... It's easy from this side of the table at this moment to go and, and, and say all meaningless things that don't really matter. 
everybody has to look at themselves when qualification hasn't been made. I think that's a natural process anyway, but it looks as if Scotland are in the right lines. There's more from Martin O'Neill. We'll be talking about Scotland, uh, the great players of the past, and what we have to do in the future to try and qualify for a major tournament. We'll also be talking about Celtic and club management. Uh, it's all coming up on this football special with Martin O'Neill right after this quick break. From your own perspective, you're now looking forward to a European Championships with a, a great mm -hmm. bunch of lads. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any great expectations, ambitions to try and match what everybody in history has gone before in Republic of Ireland? I can look back mm -hmm. in countless fantastic games and tournaments. Well, I went to the draw there just recently and uh, I, I must admit, I, I thought that I would go there in a relaxed, relaxed mood because we had actually qualified for the competition. By the time the draw was made, you, you could have carried me out. <laughs> Um, I mean, we were effectively in uh, Belgium, Italy, Italy should really be in a pot one. I mean, I, who's kidding yourself? Um, they should be in pot one and we've got Sweden who know their way about competitions. So it was a difficult draw. Of course, uh, you're doing a couple of interviews in the immediate aftermath of this draw and then, I mean, it's very hard to be massively upbeat, but by the time it was over, it's a wee bit like if I can draw some analogy about as a club manager where you've just got news on a Friday about a couple of your best players being unavailable because they haven't made, uh, they've been injured during the week and haven't been able to make it. You curse your luck for a minute or two and then you get on with it. And we're still looking forward to it. Uh, the games are tough, but we're there. We're delighted to be there. But I don't think come the time that we just want to go and make up numbers. Um, and while anything can happen, let, let us go there in a, in a very positive frame of mind. Let's know everything we can about the opposition, which you expect, and let's go and know as, as much about ourselves as possible as well. You mentioned it's maybe not your place to evaluate Scotland mm -hmm. um, and their current predicament. I, I know it isn't, and that's the point. It isn't my, my, my position, no. It is your position, though, to absolutely. evaluate the Republic of Ireland, which yes, is great. Yes, yes, absolutely. You, I thought you might ask me that. Did you have a big... Did you ha Was it a big sell from the Republic of Ireland? Did you feel there was enough talent there? What have you got right uh, in the Republic of Ireland? Well, I didn't... I, I don't know about those things. If you're asking me about the job a couple of years ago, uh, Mr Trapattoni... Uh, left left the job and um, I think had done wonderfully well. Um, had qualified for uh, for the uh, Euros in Poland. Things didn't go all that brilliantly there, and then perhaps maybe that that disappointment um, fell into the World Cup campaign. So when I when I when I took the job on, um, number one, I think there's there was some reference to the fact that um, that I hesitated about it. My hesitation was only in moving from club management, the possibility of going back into club management or, or international management, uh, international management with all the things that, that go with international management. You know, the, the, the fewer games that you play, uh, the time that you have in between matches, either to um, evaluate things, as we talked about before, and, uh, and it's something that was going to be new to me. That was, but actually taking on the Republic of Ireland job was not um, uh, um, a moment of hesitation. Uh, it's a genuine honour to be a manager of the Republic and I'm delighted with it, naturally I'm delighted with it because we've actually got through yeah. and there's been a type of vindication of, um, of, I think, of the board, of the FAI board, of putting me in charge of the side to try and, and restore a bit of confidence to the team. And, and obviously try and qualify for the Euros, which we've done. And as you know, it's a results-driven business and mm. you like to focus on your team. It, it, have you got a, is the structure right in Ireland that we could maybe take a leaf out of your, your guys' book because you seem to have a lot of players that, well, we mentioned that everybody would love a world-class one, two, mm. three players, but you've got a lot of players playing at a good level. Uh, we've... Um, uh, first of all, you you uh, you asked about um, about uh, taking a, a leaf out of uh, of uh, someone else's book, if that's the case. What I feel here is that at grassroots uh, uh, level, I, I've I, I've seen here uh, as I come over and 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 work here, 
that I, uh, there's a genuine attempt to try and, and get the young players playing, enjoying it, and actually improving their, their, uh, their skills. I think that's very, very important. So that you would like to think in maybe, in, let's say not, maybe not the next generation, but the generation after that, that a group of Irish players can step onto any pitch, either in European football and world level, and actually can, can feel as if they can pass the ball, manoeuvre the ball, and be as comfortable with it as the opposition uh, generally are. That's one. But not to lose that great Irish spirit as well. We've got, we've got a couple of very, very, very good players that would, that would grace any soccer field at all in European football. And that's great to have, as, as, as I think that Scotland have as well. And would you have to be imbued with that sort of spirit? And we've got a very good spirit, which will take you a distance. It doesn't take you everywhere, but it does help in, in, in moments of crisis. And we have, I, I think that the one thing I think I've done, I think I've restored confidence to the side. And I think I've given them a bit of belief that, uh, that they feel as if they, they can compete. I think I've done that. I'm not saying that the German result proves everything, but it's kind of a, it's a, kind of a marker that suggests, I say suggests, that, uh, that we've, we're trying to do something. And you look at the home nations, England obviously will feel they can go to the latter stages. Yeah. But how great is it for you to be the manager of the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland have made it too? Well, I think that uh, uh, Michael O'Neill, um, my namesake, has done wonderfully well. Um, they, they've, they've come out of that group. They've, they've, they started off and um, got off to a really good start to give them confidence and, and have kept it going. And well done him. And any time that I've been asked in a, uh, at interview stage, yes, I have praised him to the high heavens because he's done very, very well indeed. I was a member of the Northern Ireland side in 1982 uh, when we went to the World Cup uh, in Spain, beat the host nation, still one of the great, great nights of my footballing life. And, um, and, and for Ireland now, for, for the north of Ireland to go now, and join us, or should I say we're joining them because they got there before us, um, it is really terrific for the country. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, I'm looking at it, it, those great names roll off the tongue. I'm sure Michael will feel the weight of expectation as well. You know, when you think about it, Billy Hamilton, mm -hmm. Norman Whiteside, Jerry Armstrong, yeah. yourself, just... I disagree, yeah. He, he, I, I saw Michael at the draw and I think they were carrying him out in a stretcher as well too, you know. So, and, and he's got Germany and Poland. And funnily enough, I was asked beforehand uh, who would we not want to get? And I said Germany and Poland. And the reason being is that we'd already played them. Uh, we had played them and you wanted to change it round. So what happens? Michael gets them. And I think that they've also got Germany in the World Cup as well. So good luck there, mate, if that's the case. And just to compound issues, they've got a very decent Ukraine side to play against as well. So it's tough. So we were, um, we were commiserating with each other there for a little, uh, little time. I pulled Michael off the floor after about 20 minutes, straightened him up again, brushed him down, said, listen, let's get on with it. Let's go and enjoy it. I love the fact that you mentioned there about, uh, you know, Republic of Ireland players coming up, work on their skills. You know, you played with a guy mm -hmm. that, you know, we took for granted a John Robertson, mm -hmm. but, but he worked on his skills. He was a genius. We, we love one John Robertson mm -hmm. these days. I, I, John is, I'm, I'm delighted that you give me the opportunity to, to speak about John. Uh, he was um, a teammate for quite a number of years, a brilliant, brilliant player. And I must admit, he'll take this uh, in, in the best possible way. But when, he was a, when Brian Clough arrived at, uh, at the city ground, John was essentially a centre midfield player. Couldn't get the ball to save his life, but could he pass it either foot all over the pitch? And if you'd said to me then that actually in a couple of years' time, the Nottingham Forest are going to win their second European Cup and John Robertson is going to be the scourge of Europe from outside left, well, you know, I would have taken you away and uh, dropped you in some loony bin. But marvellous player, absolutely fantastic. And, um, and he and I, as manager and assistant manager, went up to Celtic, which he still feels is one of the great times of his life. And I'm delighted to hear that. And um, I met him the other day there. He's in very, very good form. 
and um, just a great, great player. And I'm delighted you give me that opportunity. Of course, there's now a movie. Uh, has, has it changed you guys? <laughs> well, I am. I'm because uh, the movie came out and the premiere of the movie came out. Um, I believe in miracles. I think it is. Is that uh, uh, I was with the Republic team, and uh, I think it was in Poland the day that all the lads got together. At this moment, I haven't even seen it yet. You would think that they would have sent me a DVD by now, you know. I consider I was a, a contributor to the to the to the film in some sort of capacity, and um, if not, if only to talk about John Robertson. And um, so, uh, no, I've but um, great days, absolutely great, great days, and um, and and I suppose like everything else something to look, to look back on and, and obviously with great fondness. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's football show. It's part two of a special with the Republic of Ireland manager Martin O'Neill. Of course, Celtic fans will look back with great fondness at his time as manager in this part of the show. We'll be talking about those great days with the team that he had at his disposal, some great names, and of course, uh, we'll talk about his playing career with Nottingham Forest as well. Uh, and throughout the programme, we'll also get his thoughts on the current Celtic side under Ronnie Dyla and what he feels about Rangers and the call from some about stripping them off titles. It's all coming up and I'm delighted to say Martin O'Neill is here with me now. As you well know, I was one of the very, very lucky people uh, to be in Brian Clough's company uh, and sit down and have a, a, a chat with him. And he talked about yourself, talked about uh, John Robertson and those great days. Of course, there's now a movie. Uh, has, has it changed you guys? <laughs> well, I am I'm because uh, the movie came out and the premiere of the movie came out, um, I believe in miracles, I think it is, is that uh, uh, I was with the Republic team and uh, I think it was in Poland the day that all the lads got together. At this moment, I haven't even seen it yet. You would think that they would have sent me a DVD <laughs> by now, you know. I consider I was a, a contributor to the, to, the, to the film. You'll never believe this, I, I'm hoping it's in my Christmas stocking. That's first and foremost. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, was in the company of one of your teammates, John McGovern, uh, and he mentioned, you know, he'd been round the houses with Brian Clough, but when he looked at Nottingham Forest, when he eventually came with Peter Taylor, mm -hmm. you know, he, you know, the names that he was mentioning, just, they run off the tongue. You know, mm -hmm. did you sense, even as a player then, it was going to be something special? Well, I, yeah, I, I, I probably did feel that because um, in my... My early days at Nottingham Forest, um, he was only 15 or 17 miles down the way at Derby County, he being Brian Clough. They won the championship. Derby County had a really good team. Um, Brian Clough used to resign every single week at Derby, never expecting uh, Mr. Longson, the chairman, to ever accept the resignation. What happened? One day he accepted the resignation and, um, and Clough couldn't believe it. And, and so he, he left Derby County, along uh, came Dave Mackay, who was a fantastic figure. He was my manager for a year at Nottingham Forest, left to go to Derby. And I think Dave Mackay was the only person managing in Europe that could have taken over from Brian Clough and gone and won the championship. Well, I was going to say to you, you know, when you think about it, John Robertson, Kenny Burns, mm. Archie Gemmell uh, in there as well. Uh, when I say two Scotsmen, I was talking about John Robertson, and I've already mentioned Brian Clough, but I was talking about John Robertson and, uh, and Dave McCann. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to be fair, uh, you guys, two European Cups, will it ever happen again? Well, Peter, so far in this interview, you've been very nice to me, uh, which is not the case when I was manager at Celtic. In fact, you were a belligerent uh, twisting. Um, well, I shall not find the noun to describe you. So I don't know what the, what's come over you. Are you, are you a changed man? Are, you, uh, are you just being nice to me because I thought you did well uh, one day when you were comparing a show that I was at? You know, I did. Yeah. Life just, mellows you. <laughs> Uh, well, it certainly, well, it certainly has changed you, uh, not physically, uh, but uh, but absolutely fine, you know. So you've been really nice to me. I'm just waiting for the punchline. You're, just, you're about to slam me with something by telling me that uh, 
Well, the great thing Gordon Strachan used to say is because he knew the way, and you are well uh, accustomed to the way the media works, he says there, there was always two cuddles and then a left hook. Yeah, yeah. You know, you could tell, <laughs> you could Oh, tell don't that. worry, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's plenty of that. I used to think the, uh, I thought the Scottish media were pretty tough, pretty tough. You know, we won a, quite a number of games and they were still tough. <laughs> but... Um, um, Irish boys are giving them a run for their money. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Well, I'm going to ask you, uh, you know, from those days of Nottingham Forest yeah. and all the experience you gained as a manager to get you where you are now, um, Celtic seems a million miles away from that. You know, people look back with great affection yeah. on your team and your time there now because it seems such a distant memory. I think, obviously, the money situation has, has, um, has created a bit of a, a crisis there or the lack of money for a start. And naturally then with the Rangers um, uh, being demoted for financial irregularities and things like this here. So the SPL needs a very strong Celtic and it needs a strong Rangers. And I was very, very lucky because when I went there in the year 2000, Rangers, for instance, were spending £12 million on the likes of Tori Andre Flo. And, and we, had, uh, we had some money ourselves, uh, not the type of money that they seemed to uh, think that we had, but... Um, and Mark Viduka was leaving for six million. I replaced him uh, with Chris Sutton for six million pounds, who formed a fantastic partnership with Henrik Larsson. And we signed some very good players, Lennon, uh, Thompson, people like I guess are really good players. They, uh, obviously, we had um, uh, Stillian Young, Stillian Petrov, we had Paul Lambert, we had the majestic um, Henrik Larsson, Malby, people like this here, dotted all round about the place. So. Very, very strong side that proved its worth. And, and I suppose maybe people yearn for those, those days again, those people who are just too young to remember, to have not seen the great Jock Steen side. And so we were trying to follow on from that there. That's the best side that's, that Celtic have ever had. But at least our side could, um, uh, could live in their right shoulder anyway. Mm. And no surprise to you that there's a... Uh, you know, massive argument going on at the moment with Rangers, with the uh, EBT battle that's going on mm. and people saying that they should be stripped of titles. Um, it was right in the middle of your time as manager. Uh, it's a, it's a point there. I, listen, who was to know at the time? I personally speak in regardless of whether uh, there were irregularities going on there. I wouldn't take, I wouldn't take any, um, any great um, consolation over that. I had a moment there where we lost the, uh, the title against, uh, when we um, lost against Motherwell last day of the season. And that, you know, and it doesn't matter whether what was happening elsewhere to me on the field. That's where it happens. Um, I had the most phenomenal time at Celtic. I loved every single minute of it, a minute of it from start to finish. And those things are, are, those things are past. It, it doesn't, it doesn't, I, I wouldn't derive any consolation from any of that at all, honestly. And that's just me. It's what happens on the field of play that counts. And, uh, and, um, and that hopefully that's where it'll always be. So uh, not for me, great days, great Rangers side as well too, I must admit. I, I, I was nearly going to say I enjoyed the old firm games. <laughs> uh, there's no such thing as enjoying the old firm matches. I think it was uh, Walter Smith that said there was a relief at the end of the games. And I think I probably would follow in his footsteps in that one. But fantastic days. Loved them. And I loved Scotland. Grew to love Scotland greatly, I must admit. Do you think we will, obviously everything goes in cycles, do you think it'll be a better league and may, it may well bring in more money with, with Rangers back? With Rangers coming with, back, absolutely. Even Rangers coming back and Hearts and Hibs coming back. Um, a, a strong Aberdeen side, absolutely. Dundee United as well too. Dundee. Um, when when I when I was there, I tell you when we would go to Dundee United and Dundee, and be absolutely delighted that you've won the game. Delighted, relieved that you've won the matches. These games were difficult, really difficult. I'm not saying they're easy now, but Celtic now at this moment are obviously the, the strongest side in the in the league. When Rangers come back. I personally think it'll make Celtic stronger again. And I think that the, the, the concern always is that, that if, you, if, you, um, if you weaken it badly enough, then you, you probably might find a wee bit of difficulty competing against 
the sides in Europe, you know, the qualification games for the Champions League and things like that. That's when it becomes difficult. I was always concerned about those games, qualification or otherwise. But um, no, I think with the Rangers coming back and uh, hopefully uh, hearts and hibs in the foreseeable future to make it uh, a strong again, it would be great. But um, uh, you know, it, it probably needs uh, some sort of financial input somewhere along the way. Mm. And do you have sympathy for the predicament that the current manager finds? Because he can win domestically, as you mm -hmm. mentioned, yeah. but he can't buy a win in Europe. Yes, of course you have sympathy with him. Uh, you've, um, you, you want to compete in, in European football. You want, to be, you want to be getting into the Champions League. You want to go against Juventus and Bayern Munich and Barcelona and Real Madrid and drawn and you want the fans to get excitement again for, for those matches. Those European nights during my time there were something extraordinarily brilliant as were the Rangers games as well too. But that didn't mean some other nights weren't great as well. So it'd be nice to, to get that back again, get that feel good factor back at, at the club and uh, hopefully in time that will develop. John is after the break for the final part of this football special with Martin O'Neill. We'll talk about the Republic in the European Championships to finish and of course we'll get his thoughts on the current Celtic side and whether he's going to return to club management one day. It's all coming up in the next part of this football special with the Republic of Ireland manager Martin O'Neill. From the point of view of the team that you mentioned, I've spoken to a number of them uh, from those great days. Henrik, I think he's maybe watched the UEFA Cup final once. Have you ever cast your eye over it before? Uh, the answer is no. Funnily enough, I was on holiday um, just uh, last summer and I was a day or two in an Italian hotel. By pure fluke, they were showing the game. Now, I only came in uh, about a couple of minutes before before extra time set in. And that's the first time I've ever seen it. And of course, obviously appalled at the, at the goal that we've conceded uh, in extra time, then Bobo Baldi getting sent off in the match. And I suppose I did watch it when the goalkeeper, Baia, Victor Baia, goes down and he goes, spends about 12 minutes down there for uh, a sore shin. And I thought that they were, I thought genuinely that there was going to be a helicopter come and collect him and take him to the nearest hospital in Seville for that severe injury he had, where he had at least four doctors looking at him when there was absolutely and utterly nothing wrong with him. And that sort of wasting of time taking it up um, just galled me more than anything else. But, you know, we got beaten in the game. Larson was fantastic in the match. And, and it's a game we, 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 uh, we couldn't should have won. Is that still is that the lowest point in your career? Yeah, that that was that that was. We had to go. We had to go. Um, we played an extra time that night on the on the Wednesday evening, I th and, um, and then we had to go Sunday. Uh, we had extra time in that match. It was in boiling conditions. The great fans that turned out with seventy odd thousand to send upon uh, Seville for the game. And then we had to go to Kilmarnock. And, uh, and score an extra goal uh, to what Rangers were doing at home to Dunfermline. And we had to go to Kilmarnock and, uh, and better their result. And we have scored four away from home in Kilmarnock. We've missed a penalty as well too in the game. And uh, Rangers beat us by, by a goal, by one goal. And that was disappointing, <laughs> naturally disappointing. But we go and win the league the next season by about 20 points or something like that. And, um, but if you're asking me disappointing moments, that, that moment in Seville, obviously, and, and the Motherwell uh, game when, uh, when um, we, uh, we should have won about eight and, uh, and didn't do, and consequently handed the title to Rangers. But it wouldn't, um, yes, it'll dull the senses and, 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 and it knocks you a bit, but eventually, when I look back on it, um, I had a wonderful time at Celtic and um, would only change the occasional moments, which I've just told you about. Mm. Do you, would, you, would you ever go back? Where? To Celtic? Celtic. I, I think that, um, you know, the torch has passed uh, and it's passed on. Um, uh, young Lennon took up the cudgels there and did very, very well as well too. And Gordon did well. And uh, so I always think it's in capable hands. Yeah, and you're 63. 
You're the Republic of Ireland manager. I'm very young still. I feel as if I'm 30. I feel as if I'm your age and I actually look better than you. And the great thing about that, let me pick up on that point then, is there's <laughs> still club management in you. Yeah. I, I, you know, who knows what, what, what might develop. You know what I want to do now, Peter, generally, I, uh, or genuinely, I really want to, I want to look forward now to, to the Euros coming up. I really want to put um, some time and effort into it and actually try and enjoy maybe the lead up to it. And, um, and that I want, when it obviously comes in to do battle, it's a totally different uh, ball game and, and I'll have different mindset, but I want to enjoy it at least for a while. And I'll start thinking about it, you know, uh, I suppose maybe sometime after Christmas, you know, probably Boxing Day. Mm, but, but you still feel there's a, there's a long road that can take you. I mean, you mentioned the hankering for the day to day. Of yeah, I think that's something when you've been managing now for, uh, for 20 years, I think, and you've been a day-to-day -day manager essentially, I think that that is something that even managers who are managing at international level, both younger and older than me, feel it's, it's, uh, it's something that they find hard to get used to. And even after two years in the job, don't get me wrong, I love it, but uh, there are moments you think, you know, yeah, where... Um, where um, you don't, the players don't belong to you except for that little period of time that you have them and, and you are trying to get your ideas across to them, you're trying to get um, all the little points that you feel are important to try and win a game uh, over to them and, um, and like anything else, your life is in their hands. Mm, you were at a time when you mentioned the, uh, the pressures that came with being a manager, Celtic. Aston Villa, Sunderland, it seems more intense down south now with the money that's involved. There's Jose Mourinho, one of the guys that people quote as one of the best managers in the world, suddenly finds himself you know, on the edge of losing his job. Yeah, but that's management. Uh, Jose had not uh, uh, experienced a run like this in his managerial career. Uh, and even the great Sir Alex Ferguson had experienced really poor moments at, at Manchester United where the crowd were, were baying for his blood. And, uh, and, and sometimes you just need a little bit of luck to change things around. It's happened in reverse in that sense to Jose. He's finding it tough having won the league the previous year. No one would have expected Chelsea to have lost, what is it, uh, uh, nine games so far in, in, uh, in the Premier League. But as part of management, uh, he has been uh, he has been successful in his career. He's finding it tough at the moment. Uh, he is he's been an exceptional manager, uh, and uh, although I've never forgiven him for for Porto, and um, uh, and in 2003, and uh, no, and he will he will come through because he's been a splendid manager. But that is part of the, that's 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 part of the game. You have to overcome these things. What I think is happening more so than, 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 uh, than ever is less and less time, less time than before. And uh, when I was a player, even poor managers were getting a fairly lengthy time to pull, pull things around. And it was only like almost eventually you're deciding, well, actually, he's not good enough for the job. And I remember once um, Brian Clough once saying to all of us, he said, that if any of you boys have any idea or any thoughts about going into management, he said, I think again, he said, and I can't do the action as well as John <laughs> McGovern, but he said, the only inevitability about this job is you'll get the sack. And he was the most unsackable manager going at that time in Britain. So, uh, and it even happened to him at the very end. Yeah. So it, it's, it's always close by. And it seems more so than ever before. And do you think, it, you know, maybe club chairman should take a leaf out of maybe the Cloughy experience, maybe the Sir Alex Ferguson, and look and say, cut people some slack who have a record, who have a good CV, who you know have the capabilities. Well, it's getting down now to to finance more than than ever before. The money is so great in the game that no one wants, no chairman or owner of a club wants to lose his position in in the in the elite. And, and therefore, you know, people start to panic more quickly than they would have done in the past. I'm going to finish where I started, Republic of Ireland. What is achievable? What do you, what do you want to have? What would you like to happen with the assessment of the squad that you have? What would I like to have? I, I like know you'd love to win, win it. it. Yes, yeah. <laughs> uh, you're asking me this question here about um, before Christmas, when I've kind of 
uh, uh, wind down a little bit. Uh, we've had the draw made and uh, again, uh, worth reiterating, uh, not the kindest in the world, but when we go there, I think that the, the players will be ready. I th Hopefully we will be physically and mentally tuned into it. I would like, if it's at all possible, and this is in the lap of the gods, that our best players that we have, we've got some very fine players that I've mentioned to you before, are fit and available to play. And, and I just hope that come the opening game against Sweden, that we will get great support, so will Sweden, but we will get fantastic support in Paris that particular evening. And I hope that we can feed off that, that, uh, that feel-good factor that the fans will have. And, and let's see where we go. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, it's been an absolute joy. I'd love to be there in France with you, I'm sure. <laughs> well, I'm actually quite pleased that you're not, because <laughs> I assume if it's a 50-50, if you were there, there's a fairly decent chance that we wouldn't have been. So, no, and you will just have to stay and not necessarily cheer us on from afar, which I'm sure you won't, but at least, uh, at least be, at least think about us occasionally, you know? Yeah, we will do. Listen, okay. Martin, all the very best. I hope yes. you have a great Christmas and I hope you do really well in the, the tournament. That's very kind of you, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. No. I hope you enjoyed watching Martin O'Neill in our football special. There's a lot more to come on the Peter and Ruffy football show over the festive season. Coming up, I'll have a chat with uh, one of only three Scots to lift the European Cup as a captain. John McGovern of Nottingham Forest goes back over his playing career with some wonderful stories about Brian Clough, John Robertson and the aforementioned Martin O'Neill. Uh, we're also in the company of two Hibs legends. Alec Cropley and John Blackley talk me through the great day at Easter Road in the early 70s and we've got John Gagan talking us through the laughs and the heartaches of his playing career and about being one of the best after dinner speakers on the circuit. It's all coming up on Peter and Ruffy's football show over the festive season.